Pathophysiology of circulation. Cardiovascular disease is the most common cause of adult morbidity and mortality, accounting for 31% of deaths worldwide. The most common disorder of the vascular system is hypertension. Complications of hypertension will include accelerated atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction, stroke, kidney failure, and aneurysm. There is a substantial overlap between hypertension and atherosclerosis, the second most common vascular disorder. Patients with atherosclerosis are at risk for development of ischemic heart disease, which includes myocardial infarction, a stroke, and peripheral arterial disease. The primary role of blood as it travels in the circulatory system is to transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and carbon dioxide from the tissues for elimination from the lungs. Nutrients from the digestive tract travel in blood to the tissues. Metabolic waste products travel from the tissues to their point of elimination. Hormones travel from the point of production to their site of action, and the blood also carries immune system components. The circulatory system has three primary components, blood, heart, and blood vessels. The heart has four chambers and acts as a dual pump simultaneously pumping blood in both cardiovascular circuits, the systemic and the pulmonary circuit. Blood flow or cardiac output, movement of blood requires pressure where blood flows from regions of high pressure generated by the ventricles pumping into the systemic and the pulmonary vessels to regions of lower pressure, which is the right and left atria. The pulmonary circulation originates from the right ventricle with the pulmonary artery. The goal of the pulmonary circulation is to oxygenate blood and remove carbon, carbon dioxide. Therefore, 100% of the cardiac output which is volume of blood pumped by the ventricle per minute is routinely five liters per minute, will flow through the lungs. Oxygenated blood is returned to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. The systemic circulation begins with the aorta which receives output from the left ventricle and branches into numerous parallel vascular circuits. At rest, the kidneys, the GI system, and the skeletal muscle system each receive about 20% of the cardiac output. And the skin blood flow is only four to 5%. The redistribution of blood flow is an adaptive mechanism that ensures that blood is being directed to areas with greater metabolic needs during times of increased activity. All blood vessels, except for capillaries, have a three layer wall structure. Blood flow distribution to organs and tissues at rest shown in the bottom of the image and redistribution during exercise at the top of the image. It depicts the percentage of the total, cardi out, act, total cardiac output perf perfusing to each 
organ. The pulmonary circulation originates from the right ventricle with the pulmonary artery. The goal of pulmonary circulation is to oxygenate blood and remove carbon dioxide. Therefore, 100% of the cardiac output is five, routinely five liters per minute will flow through the lungs. The oxygenated blood is then returned to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. The inner layer, known as the tunica intima, consists of a single layer of endothelial cells forming the vessel lining. It has a basement membrane and a layer of elastic fibers. Folds of the intima in limb veins form a one-way valve that are essential in facilitating venous return, especially from the lower limbs when an individual is standing. The middle layer, the tunica media, is mostly composed of concentric layers of vascular smooth muscle cells. Surrounding the smooth muscle is another layer of elastic fibers. The outermost layer, the tunica externa, is composed of strong connective tissue that helps to keep the blood vessel intact. Blood flow in the systemic circulation is driven by the pumping action of the left ventricle. The pressure is highest in the aorta and falls throughout the circuit. Arteries have much thicker walls compared to veins and therefore are able to withstand greater pressure. Arteries will branch into arterioles, which represent the primary site, which is 70 to 80% of the systemic vascular resistance. The ideal site for exchange between blood and tissues are capillaries that have uniquely thin walls composed only of endothelial cells and a basement membrane. Large arteries have three primary functions. One, deliver blood from the heart to the tissues. Two, distribute blood flow to the multiple parallel circuits of the systemic circulation and three, maintain blood pressure and blood flow during diastole. Blood pumped into the aorta by the left ventricle generates hydrostatic pressure, which is a push on the vessel wall in the outward direction. This pressure is highest or greatest in the aorta and large arteries and it also contributes to wall tension. To reduce wall tension and avoid rupture, large arteries have much thicker walls compared with walls of veins of similar size. The increase in wall thickness helps to offset the effect of increased pressure and decreased wall tension. The initial compensation with wall hypertrophy may progress to wall ischemia that ultimately weakens the wall. This will set up a very vicious cycle where the vessel will begin to dilate and further increasing its radius and then the wall will increase in tension. This will form a vascular aneurysm, and vas aneurysm rupture has an extremely high mortality rate.
Compliance describes the ability of three-dimensional structures to stretch or increase in volume in response to an increase in pressure. Arteries are less compliant than veins, but are subjected to greater pressure changes because they receive the stroke volume from the heart or systole. The aorta and large arteries contain an abundance of elastic fibers that stretch during systole and return to original shape and size during diastole. The tendency to return to their original size is known as elastic recoil function. This helps to maintain diastolic blood pressure and tissue perfusion between heartbeats. Veins are much more compliant than arteries, which makes them suited to function as a blood reservoir. And this is referred to as cap capitants. Arterial compliance receives the blood ejected from the ventricle while yielding to stretch with a moderate elevation of systolic pressure. The elastic recoil contributes to diastolic pressure that maintains blood flow during diastole. Blood flow velocity and cross-sectional area are inversely related. Therefore, blood velocity is highest in the aorta and large arteries and lowest in the capillaries. Shear stress is created by the flow of blood along the arteries. This will stimulate the production of nitric oxide. Luminar flow in a large blood vessel refers to layers of blood traveling smoothly parallel to the long axis of the vessel with the blood in the middle of the vessel having the greatest velocity and the surrounding layers are traveling more slowly. Think of water flowing down a river. It's very fast in the center, but it is slower on the edges. Blood flow can become turbulent at narrowed areas and at branch points. Turbulent flow will cause vibration of the vascular wall and result in bruise that can be auscultated over narrowed vas vascular segments. The endothelial cell and smooth muscle layers will generate and respond to a variety of biochemical mediators. The most important is the production of nitric oxide by endothelial cells that diffuses to the underlying smooth muscle layer and promotes vasodilation. It also maintains vessel patency and vascular wall health and assists in lowering blood pressure. Decreased endothelial nitric oxide production is a hallmark of endothelial dysfunction that contributes and accompanies atherosclerosis. Vascular diseases cause more morbidity and mortality. Arterial diseases are the most common and have two principal presentations. Atherosclerotic narrowing or complete obstruction of the vessel lumen leading to tissue ischemia and weakening of the, vessel, the vascular wall 
leading, leading to dilation or aneurysm, and then rupture and hemorrhage. The most common sites of atherosclerosis are the abdominal aorta, coronary arteries, thoracic aorta, femoral and popliteal arteries, carotid arteries, vertebral, basilar, and middle cerebral arteries. Atherosclerosis is the buildup of plaque within the walls of large conduit arteries and is seen in various degrees in most individuals. Atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory response to the accumulation of lipids or the low density lipoprotein cholesterol, as well as macrophages in the arterial wall. The initial atherosclerotic lesion is known as a fatty streak. Plaque growth begins with recruitment of additional inflammatory cells, T lymphocytes, dendritic cells, platelets, and mast cells are recruited. Vascular smooth muscle cells produce a fibrous cap over the plaque and underneath inflammatory interactions and cholesterol deposits continue. This is known as complex plaque or atheroma. This stage that causes the vessel lumen narrowing. The intima media thickness and vascular calcification can be measured clinically as indicators of atherosclerotic progression. Fatty streak initiation. The endothelial cell injury permits low density lipoprotein particles to migrate from the blood to the subendothelial layer or the intima. This is promoted by increased levels of LDLs, acute phase proteins, and inflammatory cytokines. Local inflammatory mediator generation is when the endothelial cells upregulate adhesion molecules promoting the recruitment of monocytes. Monocytes will differentiate into macrophages and continue production of cytokines and reactive oxygen species. The LDL particles undergo oxidation leading to modified lipoproteins. The inflammatory cells are recruited and activated the macrophages upregulate scavenger receptors and ingest the MLPs, becoming immobilized foam cells. Platelets, T lymphocytes, dendritic cells, and mast cells are recruited into the growing plaque, producing their own inflammatory mediators and cytokines. Smooth muscle cells are recruited to the intima. The smooth muscle cells produce extracellular matrix, including proteins like collagen, that contribute to plaque growth and stiffness. Smooth muscle cell proliferation swells the bulk of the plaque and forms a fibrous cap. The growth of complex plaque is a continuation of the above, above processes to promote the plaque growth. Within the plaque, some cells are dying by apoptoesis, even as others are proliferating. The death of foam cells leaves cholesterol crystals. Apoptic cells contribute inflammatory debris 
and calcification cores harden the plaque. The thrombo thrombogenic potential, the platelets are recruited to the inflammatory lesion and overlying endothelial cells lose their antiplatelet characteristics. The platelet adherence and activation can promote thrombose formation. The initial stages of plaque growth swelling, the intima, is accompanied by an increase in vessel outer diameter. Therefore, the size of the vessel lumen is preserved and the patient is asymptomatic. Narrowing due to atherosclerotic plaque changes the hemodynamic factors causing turbulent flow just beyond the plaque. As the vascular wall stretches, it weakens and the aneurysm starts to form, causing increased vascular diameter. This leads to further changes in hemodynamic forces that increase wall tension, which then causes the aneurysm to progressively grow and eventually rupture. There are various risk factors for atherosclerosis. Some of them are non-modifiable, meaning they cannot be changed, and others can be changed and they're known as modifiable. The endothelium plays a critical role in maintaining vascular health. The healthy endothelium secretes substances most importantly, nitric oxide. Healthy endothelial cells are impermeable to large molecules like lipoproteins. And healthy endothelial cells provide an intact lining layer that protects the vascular wall. Normal endothelial cells are also smooth and present a surface that does not support adhesion of leukocytes or thrombus formation. Damaging forces like altered shear stre stress, local turbulent flow, hypertension, smoking, inflammation, dyslipidemia, as well as hyperglycemia, all contribute to early stage of endothelial injury and activation. Low density lipoproteins normally contribute to homeostasis by serving as the major source of cholesterol for tissues like steroid hormone producing cells. LDL deposit is a critical step in initiating atherosclerosis. Hyperglycemia is often accompanied by dyslip dyslipidemia due to increased lipid production with increased triglyceride and cholesterol levels that include LDL cholesterol. Metabolic sim syndrome is diagnosed by having three or more of the following findings. A waist circumference greater than 40 inches in men or 35 inches in women blood triglycerides greater than or equal to 150 milligrams per deciliter, HDL cholesterol less than 40 milligrams per deciliter in men or 50 milligrams per deciliter in women, a blood pressure greater than or equal to 130 over 85 millimeters of mercury or taking medication for hypertension, a fasting plasma glucose level greater than or equal to 110 deciliters, milligrams per deciliter, or taking medication for diabetes, LDL 
deposition and monocyte recruitment and activation are early consequences of endothelial injury and activation. As the macrophages detect oxidized LDL, they begin to express scavenger receptors that increase phagocytosis of the LDL. As they accumulate cholesterol, the macrophages turn into the foam cells and they can no longer leave the now growing atherosclerotic plaque. Macrophages secrete cytokines that recruit the T cells to the plaque. Familial hypercholesterolemia is an autosomal dominant disorder that is associated with lifelong elevate, elevated levels of LDL cholesterol. The heterozygous form may affect as many as 1 in 200 to 250 individuals in the United States. The most common is a defect in the LDL receptor that reduces its ability to bind circulating LDL particles and to remove them into cells by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Reducing risk. The American Heart Association's emphasis on health on health promotion. Individuals need to manage their blood pressure with a goal of a systolic less than 120 and diastolic less than 80. Controlling cholesterol through lifestyle changes and medications if necessary. Reducing blood cholesterol, increasing physical activity, eating a healthy diet, variety of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, poultry, avoid adding salt and sugar and fats, losing weight, and stop smoking. Peripheral arterial disease is a disorder caused by stenosis or occlusion of the aorta or arteries of the limbs. Peripheral arterial disease is most common in the legs and can result in vascular rupture, dissection, and thromboembolism. Most common presentation is intermittent claudication, which is pain and ache, cramp, or fatigue of muscles that occurs during exercise and is relieved by rest. Intermittent claudication always presents below the site of stenosis. Arterioles provide resistance to support blood pressure while regulating flow to tissues. Normal arterial pressure is critical for driving blood flow through the series of narrowing vessels and for ensuring normal perfusion to all the organs. A constant supply of oxygen to the brain is essential for maintaining consciousness and arterial pressure ensures adequate flow while standing. Because of this, the arteriolar resistance limiting outflow and maintaining arterial pressure is central to upright posture and and normal ambulatory function. The arterioles have a relatively small diameter and thin walls consisting of intima, media containing smooth muscle layers that are one to two cells thick and a thin adventitia. Innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, and their smooth muscle cells display G protein coupled and other receptors for norepinephrine, as well as circulating and locally generated mediators. 
Mediators that cause smooth muscle contraction produce vasoconstriction and mediators that cause smooth muscle relaxation, relaxant, relaxation produce vasodilation. Smooth muscle is under local control that regulates tissue perfusion according to the need or in response to local tissue damage and disorders. Disorders of these resistance vessels include hypertension, a state of inappropriately high vascular resistance, and shock, a state of inappropriately low vascular resistance. Mean arterial pressure is the average driving pressure in the circulatory system. To summarize, arterial blood pressure is primarily determined by two factors, cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Typical arterial pressure waves showing the peak or systolic and trough or diastolic pressures. The dichrotic notch indicates a brief increase of pressure when the aortic valve closes and pressure rebounds against the now closed valve. At resting heart rate, about one third of the time is, set, is spent in systole and two third in diastole. Systolic pressure is influenced by cardiac stroke volume and pressure and by properties of the aorta and large arteries. Diastolic pressure is influenced by properties of the aorta and large arteries as well as by vascular resistance. Total peripheral resistance hinders blood, blood flow from the left ventricle and is a major determinant of blood pressure. Determinants of mean arterial pressure are cardiac output, total peripheral resistance, and central venous pressure. The poissule hagen formula relates flow and pressure to the individual factors that determine vascular resistance. The length of the blood vessel under normal conditions changes very little once a person is full grown. The viscosity of the blood decreases in anemia and increases in polycythemia. Otherwise, it stays relatively constant and stable under standard conditions. The radius of the vessel is the main factor controlling vascular resistance on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Resistance is directly related to the radius raised to the fourth power. Therefore, even small changes in vascular resistance translate to large, diverse changes in resistance. Increasing the radius vasodilation by 19% would cause a 50% drop in resistance. Reducing the radius by 16% doubles the resistance. The general principle in the systemic circulation is that pressure is highest in the left ventricle during cardiac ejection or systole and drops throughout the cardiovascular circuit as the vascular resistance hinders the flow of blood. Vascular pressure drops throughout the systemic circuit and the difference between the initial pressure in the aorta and the final pressure in the right atrium is the force driving blood flow through
through the circuit. The greatest pressure drop is at the level of the arterioles because they are the sites of greatest resistance. Falsatility also ends at the arterioles. Pressure in the capillaries determines fluid movement across the capillary walls. The resistance of arterioles regulates blood pressure in the aorta and large arteries, while also regulating tissue blood flow at the level of the capillaries. Increasing arteriolar resistance by arteriolar constriction is like stepping on a garden hose, and this will increase the pressure in the arteries, which is the example of the hose segment between the faucet and the boot. But it will decrease the pressure in the capillaries following those arterioles which is the hose segment after the boot. Under pathological conditions, hypertension, the arteriolar resistance may be too high, causing an elevation in blood pressure and the potential for reduced tissue perfusion due to decreased capillary resistance and flow. Decreased arteriolar resistance shock can cause a dangerous decrease in arterial blood pressure and the potential for loss of fluid into the tissues due to increased capillary pressure and flow. The effects of the changes in arteriolar resistance on vascular pressures is shown in the image. The green line is normal baseline conditions. The purple line is increased arteriolar resistance due to vasoconstriction. The blue line is decreased arteriolar resistance due to vasodilation. The arrows show the direction of vascular pressure changes. Blood pressure is controlled by short-term, minute-to-minute, and long-term, hours-to-days mechanisms. Short-term mechanisms are primarily neural, which are baroreceptor reflex by the autonomic nervous system, humeral, circulating meteors, mediators, angiotensin II and vasopressin, and local mediators, nitric oxide, bradykinin, endothelian, and prostaglandins. These mechanisms alter vascular resistance by changing arteriolar diameter and cardiac output, by changing the heart rate, the contractility, and the preload. Short-term control of blood pressure is accomplished by rapid activity of the baroflex, a neural mechanism relaying the signal of increased or decreased blood pressure to the brain stem leading to appropriate adjustments of the parasympathetic and sympathetic cardiovascular outflow. Short-term involves increases and decreases of the sympathetic nervous system vasoconstrictor activity. Long-term mechanisms are primarily endocrine and include hormones that affect the renal system fluid balance, aldosterone that is secreted by adrenal cortex, vasopressin secreted by posterior, pitu posterior pituitary, and 
nitriuric peptides secreted by the heart. These mechanisms alter blood volume by modulating fluid output, which is renal, sodium, and water excretion with fluid intake via the hypothalamic sodium and water appetites. Long-term control of blood pressure over hours and days is accomplished by sensors that detect circulating blood volume and blood pressure and adjust the fluid intake and renal fluid excretion to alter the total body fluid volume. Autoregulation is defined as the ability of an organ to maintain constant blood flow over a range of perfusion pressures. The kidneys and the brain have additional tissue specific mechanisms maintaining relatively constant flow despite varying perfusion pressures. Autoregulation is a property that maintains blood flow relatively constant over a wide range of perfusion pressures. In the image A, with autoregulation present, a decrease in pressure is compensated for by a decrease in resistance, restoring flow related relative to the condition of passive responses to the pressure changes. In B, a system with autoregulation can vary between dilated vessels and constricted vessels to maintain a relatively constant flow despite altered pressure, perfusion pressures. Mechanisms that can account for autoregulation include myogenic responses and control by tissue metabolism. A major extrinsic influence on vasoconstriction and vasodilation is the presence of receptors on smooth muscle that allow responses to circulating and local mediators. Contraction needs calcium, calmutilin, myosin light chain kinase. Relaxation needs myosin light chain phosphatase. Remember that the G protein receptors influence vascular smooth muscle. Norepinephrine is a sympathetic neurotransmitter mediating tonic vasoconstriction. This vital mechanism maintains normal blood pressure, especially in an upright position. Drugs that block alpha-1 adrenergic receptors can cause very low blood pressure and severe postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system has multiple effects that support blood volume and blood pressure through its actions in the kidneys and on vascular smooth muscle cells. Angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor at vascular AT1 receptors and the key regulator of adrenal aldosterone secretion. Aldosterone, the final mediator of the RAS system, simulates sodium conservation through its actions on the distal nephron. Angiotensin II acts within the hypothalamus to stimulate thirst. Vasopressin is a posterior pituitary hormone that regulates renal water retention and prevents whole body hyper, hypertonicity. 
Vasopressin is released in response to increased blood osmolality or by hypovolemia and hypotension. Epinephrine released from the adrenal medulla in response to the sympathetic nervous system stimulation is important in blood pressure regulation. Epinephrine can stimulate alpha-1 adrenergic receptors causing vasoconstriction, and it can stimulate beta-2 adrenergic receptors in skeletal muscle arterioles causing vasodilation and increased muscle blood flow during exercise. Nitriuric peptides are produced in the heart and other tissues, include atrial nitriuric peptide, ANP, the BNP and CNP. ANP and BNP are released from cardiac tissue when it is stretched under conditions of hypervolemia. The nitriuric peptides act on the kidneys to promote glomerular filtration and to reduce sodium reabsorption. Granular cells in the wall of the kidney's afferent arterioles sense sodium and chloride concentration reaching the macula densa at the junction of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule and release renin if sodium and chloride levels fall. Renin circulates in the plasma, cleaving angiotensinogen produced by the liver and releasing angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is cleaved by ACE, releasing angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 activates body systems of sodium conservation, water repletion, and vasoconstriction, restoring normal blood pressure and glomerular filtration. Endothelium-produced nitric oxide is essential for maintaining normal blood flow during physiological conditions. Endothelial dysfunction is common in diabetes, hypertension, and atherosclerosis, causing decreased nitric oxide production and contributing to vascular pathology. Endothelium-derived nitric oxide as a vasodilator. The circulating mediators in shear stress stimulate endothelial cell nitric oxide synthase to synthesize nitric oxide, which then diffuses through the internal elastic lamina and into vascular smooth muscle cells. Here it activates guanyl cyclase, producing vascular smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilation. Arteriolar resistance is determined by the balance of local and systemic vasodilator and vasoconstrictor influences in health and disease. Vascular smooth muscle cells integrate many signals. Calcium entry through L-type calcium channels stimulates vascular smooth muscle contraction, which is also modulated by several types of G-protein coupled receptors. Agents that increase intracellular calcium promote vasoconstriction while increased cyclic nucleotide C-AMP and C GMP promote vasodilation. Long-term changes in vascular smooth muscle gene expressions account for the development of hypertrophy in the context of hypertension and vascular disease.
Rapid adaptation to short-term changes in blood pressure occurs through a negative feedback system, the baroreceptor reflex. This regulates autonomic outflow to the blood vessels and the heart. This reflex is triggered by changes in blood pressure. Baroreceptor fibers have stretch sensitive nerve endings in the aortic arch and carotid sinus. Firing rate increases when blood pressure increases and decreases when blood pressure decreases. Baroreceptors synapse in the nucleus of tractus solitaris, where relay neurons project to vagal preganglionic neurons in the nucleus ambiguous and to the rostral and caudal ventrolateral medius. It centers oh, medius, medi, medulla's centers that stimulate sympathetic neurons in the spinal cord. An acute increase in blood pressure will elicit an acute decrease in heart rate and a decrease in tonic sympathetic vasoconstriction. The combination of decreased heart rate, which decreases cardiac output, and decreased sympathetic vasoconstriction, which decreases per peripheral resistance, returns blood pressure to normal levels. The baroreceptor reflex is important in B2B regulation of blood pressure and plays a vital role in preventing postural hypotension when moving from a supine to an upright position. This homeostatic system is responsible for short-term compensation for altered blood pressure rather than chronic alterations. Hypertension is defined as a blood pressure of greater than 130 millimeters of mercury systolic or greater than 80 millimeters of mercury diastolic pressure. Prevalence increases with age, greater African ancestral descent, and increased obesity or diabetes. The consequences of untreated or undertreated hypertension are severe and may include stroke, coronary heart disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, peripheral arterial disease, heart failure, and chronic kidney disease. Hypertension is generally asymptomatic, so it often goes undetected and only detected by random screening or when blood pressure is measured during a medical visit. Chronic kidney disease produces hypertension through dysregulation of body salt and water balance. Endocrine disorders that present with hypertension include Cushing disease, hyperthyroidism, and pheochromocytoma. At the time of diagnosis of mild hypertension, the usual presentation includes normal heart rate and cardiac output, urinary sodium and water balances that appear typical, and no evidence of suppression of sympathetic tone or increased parasympathetic outflow that would indicate baroreflex compensation. The treatment focuses on reducing blood pressure to normal levels through lifestyle changes and medications. Elevated blood pressures tend to promote compensatory thickening of the, ves the blood vessel wall and causes endothelial damage and vascular expression of inflammatory cytokines that accelerate atherosclerosis formation. Endothelial dysfunction reduces nitric oxide formation and promotes platelet aggregation and clot formation, 
increasing the risk of deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary emboli, and cerebral infarctions. All of the end organ complications of hypertension are accelerated by comorbid diabetes. Lifestyle changes include reduced sodium intake, increased dietary fiber, and potassium. Heart healthy dietary approaches to stop hypertension, the DASH diet, or Mediterranean diet. Weight loss, exercise, and smoking cessation. Pharmacologic management most commonly includes drugs that promote sodium excretion, chlorothiazides, and agents that block the effects of the RAS, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers. Calcium channel blockers that target the vascular smooth muscle calcium channels and beta blockers that reduce heart rate and cardiac output are also commonly used. Although none of these cures hypertension, they reduce and organ damage, morbidity, and mortality that is associated with essential hypertension. Shock is a clinical state of severely decreased blood pressure and blood flow that greatly reduces tissue perfusion and oxygenation. It constitutes conditions of reduced blood flow to the tissues that can ultimately progress to widespread tissue hypoxia, ischemia, and cell death. Shock can be initiated by a variety of events that would include trauma with hemorrhage, anaphylaxis, sepsis, obstructed blood flow, and myocardial infarction. Blood volume or blood pressure is insufficient to perfuse tissues particularly in the upright position. Syncope is usually one of the first indicators of inadequate blood flow and blood pressure. As the perfusion worsens, the system progresses from comp compensated to decompensated shock and eventually to circulatory collapse. Compensated shock constitutes a period when arterial pressures may not reflect the full magnitude of the incidence. Any acute reduction in system, systemic blood pressure triggers an immediate baroreflex mediated increase in heart rate via withdrawal of parasympathetic tone. The fall in blood pressure activates a sympathetic nervous system mediated increases in heart rate, contractility, vasoconstriction, and RAS activation. These adjustments are evident by tachycardia and decreased peripheral perfusion, leaving the extremities cool to palpation. As the blood flow diminishes to the periphery, carbon dioxide accumulates and lactic acid levels rise. Long-term reduction of blood flow to the limbs and organs will cause tissue hypoxia and damage that counteracts vasoconstrictor influences and promotes progression from compensated shock toward complete multi-organ system failure. Decompensated shock is a transi transitional phase that signals the development of tissue damage. Stacks of red blood cells detected in blood smears block capillaries and decrease blood delivery to the tissues. Tissue damage will become widespread and severely ischemic tissues release a host of cytokines and other damage signals of disrupted cellular ATP formation. Severe hypoxia promotes anaerobic metabolism, resulting in widespread lactic acidosis. If the systemic pH drops severely, then alpha-1 adrenergic receptors will become unresponsive 
to sympathetic stimulation. This leads to the loss of sympathetic tone and rapid, rapid circulatory collapse. Irreversible shock and circulatory collapse is where the body reaches a point at which recovery is no longer possible. The widespread vascular decay is evident as blood settles and pools into the lowest regions. These broad red, purple, red and purple patches on the skin indicate the heart is no longer able to support circulation, that vascular damage is extreme and death is imminent. Any event that causes a decrease in circulating blood volume can cause hypovolemic shock. It can be due to traumatic or surgical hemorrhage, severe blood loss, dehydration, and severe GI fluid loss. Severe blood loss reduces the circulating volume, therefore decreasing cardiac preload. This decreases cardiac output and lowers the blood pressure. Baroflex compensation increases sympathetic activity to increase heart rate and cardiac contractility and promotes alpha-1 adrenergic receptor mediated vasoconstriction. The RAS is activated to further raise blood pressure through increased vascular resistance. Increased resistance may compensate and maintain blood pressure near normal, but the individual still has low cardiac output and may still progress to decompensation. The tree to, to treating hypovolemic shock is rapid replacement of circulating volume. Patients treated <coughs> excuse me, by replacing fluids have an excellent chance of full recovery. Events producing massive vasodilation can produce distributive shock. Blood volume is initially normal, but massive vasodilation reduces peripheral resistance, abruptly dropping blood pressure, this includes anaphylactic shock, septic shock, and neurogenic shock. Anaphylactic shock is the worst case response of severe type 1 allergy or hypersensitivity. This causes the widespread release of histamines, resulting in profound vasodilation. Heart attacks can dramatically reduce cardiac output, resulting in cardiogenic shock. The sympathetic nervous system and RAS respond to increased heart rate and promote vasoconstriction. Because reduced cardiac contractility is the initiating event, central venous pressure becomes elevated but cardiac output remain, remains low. The focus for treating cardiogenic shock is to restore cardiac contractility as soon as possible. Disease conditions that reduce cardiac filling or obstruct blood flow can acutely and critically reduce cardiac output and blood pressure resulting in obstructive shock. This would include severe restrictive pericarditis and peri pericardial tamponade that result in, <clears throat> that restrict cardiac filling. The impairment of lung blood flow can also produce obstructive shock as caused by pulmonary emboli or tension pneumothorax.